Death Stranding released several months before I started making content on YouTube. I considered early on simply making a late review of it or something, but the idea fell off to the side as I was too busy focusing on other things. But now, over four years after the game's launch, and following a recent revisit of the game, I think I want to talk about it now. But it's not necessarily going to be a review. This is more of a personal retrospective that will have parts that sound like a review because I will touch on the quality of the game. And I say personal retrospective because the main purpose of the video is to discuss my own experience with the game and how I interpreted my time with it. And Death Stranding is a perfect game to discuss in this way because my thoughts on the game have evolved somewhat between my first playthrough in 2019 and my second playthrough in 2023. And because this retrospective is going to be a bit more personal than most of my reviews, I'm probably more inclined to say some things that others might consider to be hot takes. I would be lying if I said I didn't expect novel-length comments of vehement disagreement to pop up at some point. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. Let's start this off properly by rewinding time and setting the stage for things. In 2015, after months of both reported and speculated internal corporate conflict, Konami, the Japanese video game publisher known for famous franchises such as Silent Hill, Castlevania, Contra, Yu-Gi-Oh!, Dance Dance Revolution, Bomberman, Suikoden, and more, unceremoniously shut down Kojima Productions, their subsidiary and the studio behind their blockbuster stealth action IP, Metal Gear Solid. Sadly, this wasn't a complete shock, because leading up to this decision were rumors of Hideo Kojima himself leaving the studio after supposed clashes with the executives above him, which led to his own name being removed from Metal Gear Solid 5's branding. While there's no hard confirmation on what their conflict was about, it's heavily suggested by a variety of people who have dug deep into the situation themselves to be a combination of the Phantom Pain's budget ballooning out of control and Konami wanting to pivot more towards mobile game development with its lower expenditures and greater returns, while also capitalizing on its brands by using them for non-video game entertainment like pachinko machines, as many Western fans spent years mocking the company for. To make matters worse, Kojima's ousting from the company not only meant no more Kojima-made Metal Gear, but also that his upcoming project, Silent Hills, was definitively canned. This was a particularly big blow to fans, because it was seen as a potentially huge return for the dormant psychological horror series. There was so much to look forward to, from Kojima's direction, to Guillermo del Toro's co-direction, to Norman Reedus' starring role, to Junji Ito's monster designs. It seemed like a dream game made by a dream team. And, in an instant, that dream was snuffed out like a puff of air blowing out a candle. Many people voiced their frustrations by taking it out on Konami, and that does include me. It also includes Del Toro himself, who has explicitly expressed a deep dislike of the company on Twitter on several occasions. However, in December of that same year, a beam of hope decided to shine upon fans of Kojima. Turns out, the man himself didn't delay his rebound, and spared not even a single second to re-establish himself and his studio. Taking some key talent with him from Konami, including living legend concept and character artist Yoji Shinkawa, the new Kojima Productions was introduced to the world, with a cool new logo and mascot. Kojima had intentions of keeping this revival fairly small-scale. He had been inspired by his visit to Media Molecule, and found their office atmosphere to be very intimate and familial. Thus, he wanted to maintain an employee cap of about 100 at his new Kojima Productions, and cultivate a very friendly and open office culture. It was soon announced that their next project was made with the participation of Sony for the PlayStation 4, and Kojima himself traveled the world and visited various PlayStation studios to find the game engine he and his team would build their upcoming project on. 
The journey found its eventual choice after a visit with Guerrilla Games, where Kojima was handed a small wooden box containing the source code for their own proprietary engine that was used to make their PS4 launch title, Killzone Shadowfall, and their upcoming hit, Horizon Zero Dawn, and without any contractual obligations at the time. It was an immense gesture of respect and trust, and a symbol of goodwill. It was unnamed at the time, but now that the engine had crossed over to another partner studio, it was time to give it an identity, and Decima was decided on. It's a name derived from the Japanese island of Dejima, where the Dutch Empire established their first ever trading post within the country in the 17th century, kicking off strong trade relations between Japan and the Netherlands. And now it's being used to symbolize this partnership between Japanese and Dutch video game studios. At E3 2016, Death Stranding was finally announced with a confusing, cryptic, but very intriguing and memorable trailer showing a naked Norman Reedus holding a baby, surrounded by dead sea life and gazing at a sky where several ominous figures are seen floating in the air. As with many of Kojima's creations, it was a perplexing sight, but it definitely left an impression, positive and some negative, on the people who watched it. Soon after that reveal, it was settled. With a new studio set up, staff hired, and a game engine acquired, it was time for the new Kojima Productions to go full speed ahead on their next title. Death Stranding entered full-time development at the start of 2017, and slowly but surely, more information about the game came to light, including the game's surprisingly stacked cast that featured more names than anyone would have guessed Kojima was able to nab. We all knew of Norman Reedus. Emily O'Brien, Troy Baker, and Tommy Earl Jenkins were also good gets. But then Kojima snapped up Margaret Qualley, Leia Seydoux, Lindsay Wagner, Mads fucking Mickelson, and the likenesses of his film director friends Guillermo del Toro and Nicholas Winding Refn, among others who had their faces captured for NPCs in the game, such as Junji Ito and fellow game director Remedy's Sam Lake. This also includes Conan O'Brien, who provided both likeness and voice. Basically, Kojima had no trouble attracting the talent. In fact, there's a funny anecdote out there where apparently both Norman and Mads admit to not even fully understanding what the story was about, even when they were already filming. But they continued along with the project anyway because of Kojima's enthusiasm, which probably explains why he seems to make such fast friends with all these Hollywood figures and creatives he meets. But the biggest talking point as the game's release drew closer was the gameplay. Death Stranding ended up being something that a lot of people didn't anticipate, especially hardcore Metal Gear fans who were sure that Koji Pro's debut project would be at least somewhat comparable to the famed tactical espionage action franchise. Death Stranding was instead a mailman simulator, crossed with a hiking simulator, with only occasional action that the game itself recommended avoiding. Huh. And this was where responses to the game were already showing signs of being divisive. Right off the bat, there were some people who were upset that Kojima deliberately avoided making a game that aped his own creation, Metal Gear, as if he wanted to make some spiritual successor to it even though, in actuality, he had wanted to depart from the series since the end of MGS2 and hand it over to another director. And there were some people who hoped for something more horror-focused as an attempt to realize ideas that would have been used in Silent Hills which felt like a more reasonable expectation, but probably still not in the cards due to the freshness of the conflict with Konami. But of course, even among those who were dissatisfied with what Death Stranding was shaping up to be, there were those who wanted Koji Pro's first project as an independent developer to be something totally new, and thus representative of a new beginning. Some people wanted that unequaled Kojima's strangeness and ambition to be delivered in a way that was unexpected and perhaps even potentially alienating. It was a reputation that Kojima had developed over time. The creator who stuck so loyally to his vision 
that he seemed to care very little, if at all, if some players couldn't meet him halfway. It goes as far back as when Metal Gear Solid 2 switched up protagonists after the first hour. Some people are still mad at that. And then continued when Metal Gear Solid 4 gave us 90 uninterrupted minutes of cutscenes multiple times. Some people are still mad at this too. And it's continuing now, with a big budget open world adventure game with a focus on mail deliveries. The man is no stranger to aggravating a portion of his players. It's an attitude that cultivated the following he has now. Hideo Kojima was the only big name who could truly make risky, weird shit at the AAA level and get away with it. Finally, after a few years of teasing and gradual reveals of gameplay, Death Stranding launched on November 8, 2019 for the PlayStation 4. I was among those who played the game on day one and you'll be able to see as such if you scroll far enough down my Instagram page. This YouTube channel didn't exist just yet, so my thoughts on the game weren't committed to video or anything, but to summarize my feelings, I actually really liked it. Don't get me wrong, I had my own share of reluctance that a hiking and mailman simulator would be all that enthralling, even if it was made by Kojima. But I kept an open mind because there must have been a reason why he chose this kind of game as his independent debut. Who knows how long this game existed as a concept in his mind that he couldn't commit to because of his obligations to Konami. Lo and behold, I quickly found myself glued to my console for several hours at a time, every day for several straight days. Death Stranding's gameplay was an undeniable change of pace, not only for me, but for anyone who touched it that was used to how all open world games felt, even the people who hated it. Death Stranding did something that none of its AAA contemporaries even tried, and that is putting more depth into the act of traveling on foot than it put into the combat. Many open world adventure games are so obsessed with reaching the destination that the act of journeying there is just an accessory experience. It's a formality that players tolerate so they can just fast travel the next time they have to go there. It's deeply ingrained into most people's habits and expectations for an open world game. For a lot of players, and perhaps just even in general, Death Stranding was the first AAA game to really try to break those years of conditioning. And for many, it worked just fine. But for some, it was a mistake on Kojima's part by focusing on the wrong thing even though this is how it was always intended to be. Frankly, Death Stranding is just Euro Truck Simulator, but mostly on foot instead of on the road. And it's this one key difference that seems to cause a large portion of the disparagement the game receives. There seems to be a pervasive sentiment that it's pointless to make the process of walking more challenging and interesting. And I think part of that sentiment comes from the usage of the term walking simulator, a descriptor that is often used as a pejorative. It's a very unfortunate and abused term that's become so broad to the point of uselessness. I've seen people use it to describe Gears of War and Yakuza 0. Seriously. And another part of that anti-walking sentiment comes from the general idea that pretty much all of us walk every day. It's a small, uninteresting and functionally automatic thing that we do. Why bother trying to make it interesting? Well, my response to that is, why not? The point of any type of simulation game is to take the mundane and make it challenging, engrossing, and rewarding. I think Death Stranding accomplishes that excellently. If I didn't feel a satisfying relationship between mechanics, player effort, and rewards, then I wouldn't have had the inevitable second playthrough that made me want to make this video. But my first experience with Death Stranding ended up being a very positive one overall, though that's not to say it wasn't without its low points. As Kojima himself warned, the opening three hours or so of the game were incredibly slow, filled with a metric ton of tutorials and lore dumping. And the entire section of the game that had you ascend up the mountain and 
withstand an ungodly blizzard that made Sam walk even slower than he already does, damn near made me want to kill myself. But beyond that, my tenure as a Bridges Porter was actually quite fulfilling. I had a ton of fun optimizing my delivery routes, increasing my relationships with preppers to unlock more gear and structures, and basically mastering my profession. This is another aspect of Death Stranding's experience that some people were unable to reconcile with, the logistics. As a sandbox game that made it completely up to you to make your deliveries as fast as possible with any of the tools you've unlocked through your own effort, Death Stranding is without a doubt a game where you get out as much as you put in, which is another kind of experience that some people don't like. It goes hand in hand with playing on the game's terms and accepting what it's trying to be. Thankfully, I was able to do that and found my time with the game to be very rewarding. It was eye-opening being able to deliver packages along perilous routes that used to take 15 to 20 minutes to cross, but now only took two. If there's any criticism I have of the gameplay mechanics-wise, it would probably be carrying human bodies, both living and dead, because there are occasions where you have to do that. The reason why I don't like it so much is because it's sometimes sprung onto you without any warning, and unfortunately, when you need to carry a body, you can only fit two small-sized containers or one medium-sized container behind said body. So if you're already hauling a ton of stuff and are given the task to carry a body unexpectedly, you have to abandon all your shit. That was the one time I felt the game was asking for an amount of preparedness that was kind of bothersome. On the story side of things, this is where it gets a bit more divisive, even for some people who loved the gameplay. Death Stranding no doubt takes place in a very intriguing post-apocalyptic world, plagued by an almost supernatural circumstance where simply standing outside is a potentially cataclysmic event. There are creatures called beached things, or BTs, that can kill you, and if they do, your death can result in a massive explosion almost equal to a nuke in power. The rain itself, and snow by extension, is transformed into timefall, where every drop ages whatever it touches by years. It doesn't even have to be a living thing. If timefall lands on it, it skips forward by a significant amount of time. This causes major transformations in the land itself, from the formation of new mountains to smaller, weird rock structures that normally wouldn't exist yet. It's a very interesting setting that clearly had a ton of time and thought put into it. But another thing that had a lot of thought put into it, perhaps too much, is characters. Specifically, their names. Let's just say Kojima is absolutely in love with puns and double meanings in the names he gives his characters. This has been true since Metal Gear, yes, but Death Stranding brings it to a whole new level. A decent amount of Japanese writers and creators are completely smitten with how the kanji for a person's name can have multiple meanings. And Kojima placed the task of trying to translate that language quirk to English on his own shoulders to mixed results. Some are pretty clever, yes, and others are just plain grown-worthy. But I have grown accustomed to it over time. Regardless of all that, however, the game still delivers on the emotional aspect of the narrative with some incredibly strong character moments and performances. Uncovering the truth behind certain characters' motivations and their relationships with each other is genuinely captivating. And there were definitely stretches of time where I wanted to rush through deliveries to reach the next big, long, expository cutscene. We all probably know by now, but Kojima's a very indulgent guy. If he has his eyes set on a way to do things, he sticks to it. As much as I am a fan of his, I'll admit Kojima written dialogue can be very wooden or just plain unnatural, and make some characters seem borderline inhuman. But even in the face of these shortcomings, they often still manage to lead to some really powerful or memorable moments. The star-studded cast made their presence meaningful, even though it felt like some of them were in the story for a total of 15 minutes of screen time or so. 
While the adventure from the beginning to the end might have some speed bumps here and there, the last hour or so of the game is one of the most powerful endings I've seen in the last several years. From the start of the epilogue where Die Hardman gives a speech to the newly reformed UCA, all the way to the end credits rolling, is a denouement that will stick with me for a long time. It's almost a full, uninterrupted hour of the most entrancing performances in the entire game, and delivers an impactful end that wraps everything up in a neat bow while also setting up the potential for a future. Overall, my first time experiencing Death Stranding was actually quite pleasant. I walked away from the game with a new understanding and appreciation for what it was and what its goals were as an open-world adventure game that focused on travel and logistics, the process of making a journey instead of what was going to happen when the journey is over. It placed more depth in the part of adventuring that all other games purposely left shallow. I understand that for some people the instinctual response is to resist that because how many games put mechanics into simply keeping your balance while walking. Adding challenge to something so mundane can come off as bothersome, I get it. But I think it made more than enough sense in the context of the game's world, so I leaned into it. And I'm glad I did. Personally, as someone who does appreciate unique, weird stuff, I can always at least respect the attempt. I can respect a game putting its foot down and saying, you have to play like this, take it or leave it. When you're able to play a game like that on its own terms and enjoy it, it's an incredible feeling. It feels like a whole new world of video games just opened up to you. Unfortunately, some people do not feel that way. Some people reach a game where the way they want to play isn't viable or even possible, and they dislike it instinctively. I can only imagine how many people who hated Death Stranding rage quit because they couldn't Skyrim horse hop up a steep hill even though the game explicitly tells you it doesn't work that way. But I can't help but feel that it's a byproduct of years of open world games telling us that the journey is something to finish as quickly as possible so you can get to the real content waiting for you at the destination. Death Stranding turns that conditioning on its head, and while it takes some getting used to, I still appreciate it for that. One other thing about the game that a lot of people don't really appreciate or at least discuss is the simple fact that it came out really quickly. Koji Pro was established in December 2015. A game engine wasn't fully decided on until 2016, and full-time development didn't begin until early 2017, meaning Death Stranding's entire dev cycle was probably about three and a half years, maybe less, which is pretty quick for a new AAA IP. With Death Stranding finally finished, I uninstalled it to inevitably move on to other games. There was a fairly common sentiment I saw going around a few weeks after the game's launch when more and more players were finally getting around to beating the game too. Many were saying that while they enjoyed their time in Kojima's weird post-apocalyptic America, they didn't think they would ever feel the need to play it again. Many were certain that this was one of those one-and-done kind of games that you get as much out of as you possibly can on that first playthrough and never touch it again. I actually agreed with this sentiment for the most part. I felt like the slow start, the entire mountain section, and the very detailed and indulgent story would all inhibit the enjoyment of a replay. I simply left Death Stranding alone as a great game I would only play once, and moved on with my life. Every once in a while since then, I would catch some stray gameplay footage or see someone complain about other open world games becoming stale. Then I would get an itch to reinstall it, but I would just ignore the urge. There's something to say about the mere fact that even though I played it once, I thought about Death Stranding all the time, whether or not it was relevant to what I was doing or related to other thoughts I just had. I thought about the game constantly, despite my refusal to play it again. The more I thought about it, the more I respected it. 
It feels like the purest game a developer could make, because it feels like it was made with no concerns whatsoever about budget or deadlines, despite how quickly it came out. The team had a very specific game in mind and made what was exactly pictured in their collective heads, without needing to fret over mass appeal. I spent years thinking of Death Stranding like that and wishing more studios could be able to make a game in such lenient conditions. Just make ambitiously weird shit on a blank check for art's sake. After four years since that first playthrough, I finally decided to give in. I'm currently subscribed to PlayStation Plus via the Extra tier, meaning I have access to a shockingly beefy catalog of hundreds of games I can just download and start playing for no extra fee. And there's a lot of genuinely decent to amazing games in this library, to the point where I would occasionally browse it for something to play, but end up getting overwhelmed by the sheer variety and just backing out without downloading anything. But one of the games on the extra catalog is Death Stranding Director's Cut, a special version of the game with improved graphics and performance for the PlayStation 5, as well as more gameplay content. It took days of consideration to finally say fuck it and just download it. I had already played the game once before, so what's the issue if I just quit after a few hours anyway? I start up Director's Cut and I'm hit with the fact that I can't load my old save anyway, because I need to install the PS4 version to manually make my old save usable for the PS5 version. But I never intended to do that anyway. I was always going to start a new game. So I did. As the opening scenes played, I made one major realization that would end up greatly impacting this second playthrough. The realization that I remember almost everything about the game's story. It's been four years, but I can still recall basically every major plot beat and key character moment worth remembering. I don't really need to sit around and watch it all again. So, I decided to just skip all cutscenes. And unsurprisingly, this ended up dramatically improving the pace of my playthrough. Combine that with the fact that, since I've already beaten the game, I know all the ins and outs that make all the difference when it comes to surviving out in the world and making deliveries quickly and easily. My familiarity made everything so much easier this second time around, and that three-hour introduction that I was initially dreading just ended up being an hour-and-a-half-long refresher that I actually did kinda need to get me settled in again. This is when I knew that this second playthrough was not going to be anywhere near as bad as I thought it would be. In fact, the entire reason why I've decided to make this retrospective is because this second playthrough gave me an even better understanding and appreciation of the game on a mechanical level that I hadn't reached during the first experience back in 2019. Now that I was familiar with the game and knew all I needed to know about it, I was more inclined to just take it easy, relax, and focus on my deliveries without the looming desire to just rush forward and see how crazy the story gets. Upon gaining control of Sam and the director's cut, the very first thing I noticed was the beauty of the game's world. Don't get me wrong, even the PS4 version still boasted gorgeous scenery that made me stop in my tracks on occasion. But the increased fidelity with the PS5 version just made it all pop even more. The jaw-dropping vistas and landscapes struck me harder now than it did in 2019. There's something about the design of Death Stranding's map that manages to accomplish a naturalistic beauty that very few other games approach, even though it's obviously very exaggerated by design. It's like the environmental artists at Koji Pro looked at pictures and videos of the prettiest places on Earth, painstakingly recreated them, and managed to seamlessly stitch them together into two maps covering about 2.5 square kilometers for the eastern region and 18 square kilometers for the central region. Gazing out towards that lush green land or barren desert or snow-capped mountain, I thought about how some open world games approach their own maps and how they just aren't as striking. Some games don't really put any effort into the atmosphere or ambience of their world because they know players are unlikely to revisit any single spot that isn't a city ever again thanks to fast travel. 
On rarer occasions, other games try to wow players with so much cool or interesting scenery and landmarks that they end up all becoming lost in a sea of visual noise. Death Stranding somehow manages to avoid either issue and places us in an eye-catching world that reminds us of the beauty we can see in reality, just a bit embellished and condensed within the game. It's no surprise at all that some people play the game just to take in-game pictures using photo mode. Kojima himself retweets a dozen of them or so every single day, and many of them are quite nice. Related to the game's art direction is its futuristic but still somewhat grounded science fiction aesthetic. Yoji Shinkawa has always been a master at making sleek and beautiful machinery, even dating back to the rugged look of Metal Gear Rex in MGS1, which still looks badass when standing next to mechs from other media today. The equipment and vehicles in Death Stranding have a very memorable style, and although not necessarily as cool as a Metal Gear, they look like they fit the world they inhabit and suit the particular functions they were made for in-universe. The art direction is very consistent in general while still offering enough variance to stay fresh and appealing. Even the architecture is fascinating with its postmodern, specifically deconstructivist, appearance. There's not many buildings in the game, but they have a streamlined and very clean aesthetic. In fact, here's a picture of the Vitra Fire Station, located in Weil am Rhein, Germany, designed by architect Zaha Hadid. Tell me it doesn't look like a distribution center from the game. This seems to be a style Kojima is enamored with in general, because the interior of the Koji Pro office looks like something out of a meticulously produced sci-fi film. No matter how you look at it, Death Stranding just has a gorgeous sense of art direction, and it successfully merges the opposing sides of exaggerated nature and heavily manufactured structures without making either feel out of place. And I haven't even gotten to the character models. Obviously, Koji Pro used facial scanning to bring the actors into the game's digital world, but they accomplished scans of remarkable accuracy, something that some other studios can't seem to nail down as well. There's been plenty of instances where scans are obviously used to sculpt a character's face, but sometimes they end up having only a vague resemblance to the model, whereas Death Stranding's cast looks impeccable. Sam is unmistakably Norman Reedus, Clifford Unger is obviously Mads Mikkelsen, and Fragile is clearly Lea Seydoux. There's no need to squint your eyes and wonder if it's them before finally getting confirmation, it's just apparent from the get-go. And then there's the game's excellent music. Both the original score by Ludwig Forsell and the curated track selected by Kojima himself, featuring bands like Low Roar, Churches, Bring Me the Horizon, and more. Forcell's compositions hit a wide range of stylings and emotions, from slow and droning and threatening to explosive and exciting. His music perfectly merges classical tunes with some more modern synth sounds to create a sonic aesthetic that fits the visuals, tones, and pace of the game like a glove. We've got dramatic strings, somber piano, heavy bass, serene vocals, a fantastic blend of tunes that equal the ambition of the narrative and even the mechanics. Although, when you're making deliveries on foot, you'll occasionally be hit with a song from one of the aforementioned bands, which is just as effective. Kojima has a very high batting average when it comes to picking the right song for the right moment, because even when you're just walking around and minding your own business, a good track and a slow camera zoom out to capture more of the landscape can turn a random, casual minute of gameplay into a fond memory. And as the final talking point regarding visuals and sounds, there's elements of the experience that combine both with incredible execution. Specifically, I'm talking about the merger of UI elements and their associated sound effects or musical tunes. Kojima has always been very good at making UI stick out and be memorable by taking symbols and icons and pairing them with some type of audio that turns both parts into an instantly recognizable cue. As proof of that, let's briefly go back to Metal Gear Solid 1 and look at these symbols. 
If you played the game, you probably didn't even need me to actually play their associated sound effects or music to start hearing them in your head. Death Stranding carries on this legacy too, with things like the distorted tune that plays when someone calls Sam, or the short fanfare when you complete a delivery, or especially the exclamatory clash when you start the game and get a ton of likes from other players using your structures and roads. The excellence of the game's audio doesn't stop at music, it's everywhere around you. In regard to its production values and art direction, it's safe to say Death Stranding is more or less firing on all cylinders and getting a ton of mileage. It looks beautiful and sounds beautiful. But it is a video game, so does it play beautifully too? Well, this is where things get controversial, as I've mentioned before. And this is where my second playthrough surprised me. I really did think I was bound to get bored sooner rather than later simply because I knew what was in store for me. I had beaten the game once before. The joy of discovery wasn't as present now as it was back in 2019. But as I soon realized, that didn't mean I couldn't gain a new appreciation for the things that I kinda took for granted in that first playthrough. It took an embarrassingly long time, I know, but I finally noticed that Death Stranding is indeed a sandbox game, a real one. And when I say a real one, I mean it's possible to change the world around you and thus transform how you interact with it at any point and afterward. To me, that is the basic essence of a sandbox game. Although the more hardcore sandbox games don't even have a plot to follow and just throw you out into the world naked and aimless, like Kenshi or Mountain Blade. Some open world games are called sandboxes, but you don't actually change anything about your surroundings or how you progress. So if anything, those games are closer to theme parks, where you interact, but you don't modify. In some cases, a game is so strict with how you accomplish objectives, it feels like freedom doesn't exist in any capacity even in spite of the game's open world format. But Death Stranding is the opposite of that. While it may have a linear story, the game lets you make your deliveries in any way you see fit, and it really sticks by that design pillar. You have a starting point, you have your packages, and you have your destination. Everything else about the mission is up to you to fill in. Or you can forego deliveries entirely and focus on building roads or collecting materials, which eventually helps deliveries anyway. A big contributor to the sandbox design is the so-called strand system. When Kojima first revealed this mechanic, he was somewhat mocked over it, particularly over the name, which is kinda silly, but I like it. And because some people believed the mechanic wouldn't be that much of a big deal. But if there's one thing I know about Kojima's games by now, is that if he's hyping up a specific mechanic, then he probably put a ton of time into it. When I first played the game, I knew immediately how crucial it was to the experience. Your game is connected to a select group of others, and their own structures will show up in your world, and you can show your appreciation by giving them likes, which is basically just a point system to show your progress, skill, and dedication. Some people find likes pointless, and honestly, during my first playthrough, I did too. It's not like you can spend them anywhere. But in that second run through the game, I actually developed a greater appreciation for them too. As with any other game's point system, it's representative of how much you do. Likes show other players how many deliveries you make, how competent you are at them, and most importantly, how often you use other players' structures and build your own. There's a direct relationship between how many likes you have and how much you contribute to the game's world and to other players connected to you. It's another piece of the game that is directly linked to the narrative's themes of isolation and social disconnect. The more likes you have, the more you've helped your fellow man, and the more you're overcoming the loneliness in this world on the brink of cataclysm. Anyone who played Death Stranding to the end can tell you that the Strand system saved their ass at least once. In the middle of a delivery, when you're out of resources, low on life, BB's out of commission, you're hauling 150 kilos of random shit and things are looking bleak, 
the well-timed appearance of another player's structure or vehicle can be a lifesaver. It's something that makes you want to fall to your knees and thank the heavens. Mashing the like button is how you show your appreciation for a genuinely helpful and meaningful contribution to your journey. You don't care if it feels stupid to do, you're just glad they were there when you needed them. It just goes to show that the mechanic really does work exactly as it's supposed to. On the second playthrough, however, not only did I enjoy the appearance of other players' helpful structures, but I also appreciated the strand system for a different reason. And depending on Kojima's own perspective, it might even be more important than the structures themselves, and that is the sense of connection. One of the smartest gameplay decisions made for the game was not letting other players' structures take up chiral network bandwidth in your own world. This allows a metric ton of them to pop up around the entire map, and it gives the entire strand system a greater sense of utility and emphasizes how important it is to the experience. At worst, a few people might find that it makes the game too easy and turn it off. No big deal. But with the giant number of structures showing up in your game, you're bound to see a few names, player names, pop up more than once. Maybe you see the same name on multiple different structures and vehicles scattered around. Or maybe you see the same name on one structure or vehicle you use all the fucking time because you depend on it so much. When I first played the game, I viewed other players' structures as conveniences that were totally divorced from the player themselves. When I saw a well-placed timefall shelter or a generator, I took advantage of it without really thinking. The second time I played the game, I finally did what I assume Kojima wanted me to do. I actually considered the player who put those things there and acknowledged their conscious decision to do it. Either to help themselves or to help other people making the same delivery on the same path. Some other player somewhere in the world was more prepared to make this delivery than I was, and I was able to benefit from their foresight. In a game where the story takes place in a world so utterly ravaged by disaster, to the point where the last remaining humans would gladly spend the rest of their lives without setting foot outside their homes for a single second, this purposeful mechanic meant to inspire a sense of connection finally hit me like it was intended to back in 2019. I began to think about other games I've played where I interact with other entities, be it living players or just NPCs. I've played a lot of Final Fantasy XIV, well over a thousand hours at this point. But the entire time, I've only ever approached it as a single-player Final Fantasy game that just so happens to be online. Whenever I hop into a duty and cooperate with my fellow players to clear a dungeon, or a trial, or a raid, it's kept largely sterile. Most duties are done in silence, with someone only speaking when absolutely necessary. Obviously, it's an MMO, so it does offer a ton of opportunities to socialize, and I do on occasion. But those moments are mostly, if not entirely, divorced from the content I truly want to do, which is those normal duties. And in those duties, I know I'm playing with other living people, but nothing about the experience couldn't be decently replicated with competent AI. And funnily enough, that's what the Creative Business Unit 3 team at Square Enix has done. They've released updates that allow more content to be completed solo with AI teammates, or at least MSQ content, so no one who just cares about the story will ever need to interact with another player to make progress. Ultimately, I respect that decision. After all, even though 14 is an MMO, it is still extremely story-centric arguably more so than some of its single-player siblings in the same series. And then there's AAA games that try to simulate social aspects by simply giving you a populated world of NPCs and support characters. Some games that are truly dedicated to their writing, acting, and world-building can do an excellent job here, like Baldur's Gate 3, Cyberpunk 2077, or Red Dead Redemption. But a lot of games just don't reach that level either due to a lack of time or resources, or just because that's not really a priority for the game, or because the writing lead just doesn't seem to have the talent for it. 
I know I am at great risk of sounding like a broken record about this game, but I reviewed Starfield earlier this year. And when I was playing Death Stranding, I thought back to it a lot and realized how completely alone I felt in Bethesda's spacefaring RPG, despite being surrounded by companions the entire time and frequently visiting multiple populated cities. It all felt way too manufactured to have any meaningful effect on me. And this isn't just a conclusion only I came to. It's a conclusion most people have come to. Starfield has been out for four months now, and not once has a single piece of fan art depicting any of that game's companions ever naturally come across my timeline on Twitter. But I cannot escape people making posts thirsting for Asterion, Shadowheart, and Karlak. It's impossible. I see those characters every damn day whether I want to or not. But I'm quickly starting to enter non sequitur territory here. All of this is to say that Death Stranding's strand system made it feel like other players were right next to me the entire time, actively helping and guiding me. It somehow feels less clinical than doing Final Fantasy XIV duties in silence, even though I actually am playing with other living people in that game, but not here. Even though the game's themes are about loneliness and isolation, and the experience is completely a single-player one, I never once felt truly alone. In fact, I was keenly aware of other players and their own challenges from beginning to end. Whenever I walk up to a structure or abandoned vehicle and see an actual player's name on it, I get a vague sense that I must have just missed them and they were a little ways ahead of me, even though I know that's not how the game works. I've developed a quick attachment to my fellow porters because they're constantly coming to my rescue and likely don't even know it. I only see the remnants of their journeys, and they're technically not even within my own world specifically, but I know that someone was there, doing a delivery just like I was, probably barely able to balance the hundreds of kilograms of shit on their back. But they were prepared enough to create this structure that they and I can share together. You can almost read the story of another player by seeing what structures they put down and where. You can likely guess how a player messed up and probably died by looking at their abandoned package sitting at the bottom of a ravine or at a riverside. It might sound overly sentimental, but once I began this second playthrough with the intention of taking it slow and being more observant, this is just the attitude I naturally developed. I've seen people compare the strand system to bloodstains and messages in Souls games, and honestly, it's not that far off. It's similar in spirit, but Death Stranding's approach is way more detailed. I'm going to finish off this point by saying that during my playthrough, I had been making use of one specific bridge that allowed me to safely cross over a cliff. It had tens of thousands of likes and I must have walked or driven over it a hundred times. I finally took a moment to see the profile of the player who placed it, and it turns out they haven't even played the game in a year, according to their last login date. The strand system is so strong that even players who haven't touched the game since 2022 were still helping thousands of others out. I truly cannot stress enough how perfectly this mechanic works like it's supposed to, and it accomplishes that in the debut game of this series. There's not much for me to touch on regarding the actual gear and structure system, besides the fact that I think it's actually very straightforward, intuitive, and encourages making extra deliveries as best as it probably can. But there is one more thing about the gameplay I want to discuss, and it's less about any specific mechanic and more about the public perception of it. For four years, Death Stranding has been on the receiving end of a fair share of criticism. Some complaints are totally reasonable, and I might even agree with some of them in a general sense. But something that's been repeated since 2019 that's always given me a bit of a pause is when someone who has not played the game remarks on how boring it looks just by watching. And I get it. You look at almost any random gameplay session and it's mostly walking with some occasional driving and maybe some rare sneaking and shooting. 
but it is a mailman simulator at the end of the day. I can see why it may appear totally unengaging from that angle. I'm not denying that. But this is the moment where it's most important to remember that this is a game where planning and logistics is the linchpin that holds the entire gameplay experience together. There's a reason why this game continues to have players, and why some of those players end up putting well over a hundred hours into it. They're not pretending to have fun with Death Stranding. They just genuinely enjoy needing to plan for a journey and executing that plan as the journey progresses. It's a crucial part of the game. For virtually any other open world adventure game, this would be a cop-out excuse because none of them have these logistics. But in Death Stranding's case, it is absolutely true that the appeal is just not very well conveyed through video. Watching someone else play Death Stranding is like watching someone else fish or watching someone else reorganize their book collection. Activities that usually are not fun to watch other people do, but it can be fun for you if you do them within your own context. I made the comparison to Euro Truck Simulator earlier, and I do stand by it. It may come off as uninterestingly routine to make a delivery on your own two feet instead of on wheels, but Death Stranding absolutely provides the same level of relaxation and immersion, assuming you have ways to get around the BTs, mules, and terrorists, and you're not climbing up the mountain for the first time. Death Stranding's strangeness and its unrepentant commitment to its concepts and mechanics is something only a guy who is equal parts weird and ambitious could do. If any other director at a AAA studio went to their executives or publisher and pitched an open-world delivery man simulator where most of your missions are on foot and simply tripping and falling could potentially ruin a delivery so you have to hold L2 and R2 to grab the straps of your backpack while running or going uphill so you don't drop your stuff, and then asked for a hundred million dollars to fund this game, they would get screamed out of the room. Only someone like Kojima would be completely earnest in a concept like this at a AAA level and, for the most part, actually stick the landing. Another person would probably arrive at a comparable idea eventually, but the end result would absolutely not be the Death Stranding we actually got. He is one hell of an unusual and interesting creator, but also not without his quirks. The worlds he creates are crammed with backstory that is often delivered in absurdly long expository info dumps, his dialogue makes his characters sound barely human more often than not, and his obsession with detail can be just as intrusive as it is immersive. But even in spite all those odd and sometimes frustrating qualities about his work, his strengths remain apparent. When he has a concept he has faith in, he goes all the way with it. He commits. He wears his inspirations on his sleeve, and his narratives are often such a mishmash of those inspirations, you sometimes can't even tell what his message is. Yet at the same time, he's not always trying to force any single message at all. He makes stories that present themselves as is, and he lets the player interpret their own meaning. Which is something I can always respect, no matter how weird shit gets. Some people like to call Kojima pretentious, but I think that couldn't be further from the truth. I think Kojima and his creations come from a place of sincerity. It's a valid point that he might not even be sure on what to believe because he's so fascinated and influenced by American media and culture, but I absolutely still think that his games are a product of his authentic internalization of his favorite things and the talking points that arise from them. He's not exaggerating it to make himself look cool or interesting, because if he is, he's been keeping it up flawlessly for literal decades. He's been spouting weird bullshit since the 90s. If that's an act to make himself look smart, then he's the most committed person on the planet. So no, I don't think Kojima is pretentious. He's just odd sometimes. Now, I don't really think I should go into it, but I know some people will snap back with, well, by your standards, who is pretentious then? Well, if you really want to know, then look no further than David Cage of Quantic Dream. 
Detroit Become Human has such an embarrassing amount of super shallow civil rights allegories and social commentary, it can only come from someone who wrote all of it based on a few cursory Wikipedia searches at most because they don't actually believe in the true spirit of what they're about to write on. The game lets you press triangle to say, we have a dream. The game has you watch, slowly, as an android main character gets on a bus to stand quietly in the back. The game has a main menu slave girl that you can dismiss from the game once you complete it, and Quantic Dream patched her back in because some people missed her. If that's not a total failure to commit to the message, I don't know what is. And it's easy to sum up why Detroit is bad. If I wanted to go over why Beyond Two Souls, Heavy Rain, Fahrenheit, and Omicron were bad, I would need a whole separate two-hour video and a replay of all of them to refresh my memory, which I am not going to do. David Cage will wax poetic about something for hours on end with only a middle school level of understanding of it, and not once throughout the entire thing give the impression that he truly means any of it. That is pretentious to me. There's also something to be said about how Kojima seems capable of becoming fast friends with basically everyone he meets. And I don't think any of the talent from recent Quantic Dream games would be caught dead hanging out with David again. One other particular comment that some people love to say is the assertion that Kojima must hate games and wishes he could ditch the medium entirely to make movies. It's obvious the guy loves movies, yes. And he's one of the people who's been trying to make storytelling in games more cinematic in delivery since the 90s. But he's also one of the few creators in the AAA space to actually take advantage of the medium's interactivity to create opportunities for ridiculous mechanics and moments that are only possible with video games. Only a developer who loves video games would make something like the Strand System and make it work so well. Only a developer who loves video games would make a boss fight that you can beat by taking the disc out of the console, then going into the date and time settings of it, moving the date forward by a few years, and when you load into the boss fight again, it turns out he's died of old age. Only a developer who loves video games would have another boss intimidate the player by reading their console's memory card and letting you take away their psychic ability by having you unplug your controller from the first controller port and put it into the second one. Only a developer who loves video games would design and produce a Game Boy Advance game about vampire hunting that has a photometric light sensor in the cartridge so you can power up your in-game weapon by standing in sunlight in real life. And let's not forget the generally absurd gameplay variety of Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain, and the unique multiplayer experiences of the first two iterations of Metal Gear Online. I spent an ungodly amount of time with MGO1, which came with Subsistence, and MGO2, which came with Guns of the Patriots. Those online modes did not feel tacked on or like an afterthought made to check off a box. They were their own very distinct experience. Basically, I know Kojima has flaws as a creator, but he's a guy with ambitious, weird, niche ideas and he's one of the few to put those ideas in a AAA game with total willingness to follow through on all of his concepts, which is a section of the industry that's in dire need of people like that at the moment. And as long as he's willing to take those risks and make games that are strange, fully committed, and potentially alienating, I will always have at least some level of respect for him. I would rather have a weird Kojima game that I might hate than another mediocre Call of Duty or another live service game that's doomed to shut down less than two years after launch, or another superhero game that's only kinda good but is so successful that it turns its developer into another Marvel or DC game conveyor belt even though they have their own IPs they could pay attention to. Way too many big name publishers would rather put $300 million into any of those projects I just listed instead of a quarter or less of that 
into something new and somewhat niche, and it's just not sustainable. And yes, I am referencing the revelation of budgets shown off in the unfortunate Insomniac hack that occurred this past December, where it was revealed that Spider-Man 2 cost three times more to produce than the first, yet absolutely did not feel anywhere close to having three times the effort put into it. I don't actually want a AAA gaming crash because I don't want tens of thousands of people out of work. But if a crash is the only thing that'll hit the reset button and force companies to scale back on things to a reasonable level again, instead of slamming the accelerator on reckless spending, then I have a towing service on speed dial. But let's get back on track here and start closing this video out before I go off into a separate tangent. Overall, I consider Death Stranding to be a hit. Maybe not necessarily sales-wise, but with me personally. It more or less struck a bullseye on the kind of game I needed to play, even if I wasn't aware of it. That first playthrough in 2019 helped me expand my horizons a bit, and my recent second playthrough somehow did it even more. There's a lot of games out there that might claim that the journey is more important than the destination, and for some that is still true. But for Death Stranding, the journey is the only thing there is. With its gorgeous and environmentally diverse world, its crazy story with fascinating concepts, its talented cast, beautiful music, perfect blend of sound and visuals, and shockingly well-oiled game mechanics that I can tell work exactly as they were meant to, I can walk away from this game knowing that it's something special. Even all this way into the video, some of you might still be absolutely dumbfounded at how anyone could enjoy Death Stranding sincerely. Even though I said I'm not pretending that I am, and I ended up enjoying a second playthrough more than I did the first one. But that's fine. At the end of the day, I don't need to convince anyone of anything. The great thing about video games today is that there's so many of them, and so many are so good, that there's a solid chance that one of them, at some point in the future, will make you feel the way I feel about this one. And when you find that game, you won't need some random YouTuber like me to make a case for it, because it'll speak for itself, just as Death Stranding spoke for itself to me. As of right now, people are waiting for Death Stranding 2, which received an announcement trailer back at the Game Awards 2022. It's unclear exactly how much time has passed within this new story following the end of the first game, but the trailer absolutely left an impression with some of its visuals that might be telling of the story to come, especially considering the return of a certain Troy Baker. There's a few things that come to mind when I think of the future of this franchise. I recall Kojima cracking self-deprecating jokes about Death Stranding not selling as well as he had hoped, and that if he had made a better game, it would've. Of course, the fact that we're getting a sequel at all suggests the game did well enough anyway, but it does make me wonder if he's going to make some changes to the core of the experience. Will delivery still be a focus? It seems like it should be, considering it was such an important part of the first game's identity, but there is still a lot we don't know. Could Kojima take steps to ensure the game's pacing becomes a bit faster sooner? Perhaps players will unlock the Bola gun, zip lines, and exoskeletons very early on. If he does make that decision, I honestly won't blame him. It seems like a reasonable change to make. The thing that would disappoint me, however, is if there is a greater shift towards action, especially without any of that typical Kojima creativity or ambition. I can forgive a new focus on action if the gameplay is closer in feeling to how the Phantom Pain was, especially when it comes to options and variety in equipment, but I've still come to expect some sort of twist that will make the game more intriguing to some and bothersome to others. It just wouldn't feel like a full-blown Kojima game if it didn't do that. It would certainly be a pain in my ass if I made this positive retrospective only to be given a sequel that's nowhere near fascinating but perhaps I'm worrying too much. After all, every single time I think Kojima might finally make something that doesn't hit with me, he ends up proving me wrong. But I guess time will tell.
This concludes my personal retrospective on Death Stranding. Thank you for watching, and keep on keeping on.